Thank you. Um, the title of my talk is Evolutionary Dynamics. Um, what fascinates me about evolution is the ability to describe it mathematically. So in my opinion, evolution is actually or has very much become a mathematical theory and can really be best formulated with mathematical equations. Uh, there are many verbal presentations of evolution kind of out there and some of them are good, you know, but they are typically not as accurate as the mathematical one. A quantitative understanding of evolution uh, requires the mathematical formulation. And this is what I wish sort of the field evolutionary dynamics to be, <clears throat> the mathematical exploration of the evolutionary process. And the talk today will be more on the abstract side. Um, we also work on specific problems, for example, like the spread of CRISPR-based gene drives or evolution of cancer, viruses. Cancer itself is an evolutionary process where cells get mutations uh, and selection then leads to uh, lesions. And so um, we, we studied the evolutionary dynamics of response to treatment, such as immunotherapy or, or targeted therapy. Or these are our applied research projects. But today I will talk mostly about the underlying uh, mathematical formulation of some of the questions that we are very excited about. So you please excuse me that it's somewhat more on the abstract side. Um, so we begin with the following question, what is evolution? What is evolution? And um, Ernst Mayer, uh, an evolutionary biologist uh, who lived to be more than 100 years of age, he wrote a book, What Evolution Is? And in that book, he asks also that question, what is evolution and what is it that evolves? And he says, uh, figuratively, we talk about, say, evolution of species. That was his field. We talk about the evolution of genes. We talk about the evolution of genomes, of the evolution of the brain, or something like this. But the only thing that actually evolves is the population. The carrier of the evolutionary process is the population of reproducing individuals. So evolution occurs in populations, and populations consist of individuals that kind of reproduce. And this reproduction we can think of as genetic, but it's not only genetic. In the realm of humans that we often wish to explore, that reproduction is also cultural. So a person has an idea, and that idea spreads. And people learn from each other. And that learning process, I also analyze with evolutionary dynamics. So I constantly try to expand what I would even call evolution. And I'm not absolutely sure where the limits are of what we would call evolution once we go into learning and into these sort of things. So we can think of reproduction, genetic, or cultural. And then the two fundamental ingredients of the evolutionary process based going back to Darwin are really mutation and selection. Mutation meaning there's a new type and selection means that something grows faster than something else. And th these are the two fundamental principles. And over the last 20 years, I have tried to add a third principle to this and that would be cooperation. And I want to make the point that somehow cooperation, and we will encounter aspects of cooperation also in this talk, is a kind of master architect of the evolutionary process. <clears throat> evolution is not only competition, it's not only fighting, it's always fighting also, but there's something else also, and this is this helping. And I help you and you help me, or cells help one another, or genes uh, that's in, in protocells that begin to form, they kind of help each other reproducing. And so you see, if you really look for it, that cooperation is that which gives, uh, which lifts uh, biological organization to a higher level. It allows the evolution of genes, of cells, of multicellularity, of cells with organelles, of animal societies, and of humans. And if you ask what is really specific about humans and the evolutionary eye, it is human language. Human language is something that emerges, and there are also other projects that we have about human language in cooperation, in people, in groups of people that cooperate, that want to communicate with each other. Yes? But isn't it subsumed by competition? By what? By the competition now. I think that um, I would build it hierarchically. So fundamentally, you have variation. And once you have variation, you have competition. Once you have competition, it can also be cooperation. So I would build it hierarchically. It is not something that is instead of uh, selection. But I would argue that if we just have the competition in mind, we actually don't get this uh, amazing discoveries of evolution, these kind of levels of organization. But to me, it makes sense also if you, the, in the first example of selection, mm -hmm. you will just select for the fittest organism. And that's true if there's no interactions. 
And if there's interactions, cooperation is a type of interaction between different genomes or different species, but you could also have negative interactions. Yes, yes, exactly right. That's exactly right. So when we have evolution of cooperation, we always want to find a mechanism that allows natural selection to favor cooperation. That's our evolution of cooperation. And in this world of mathematical descriptions of evolution, we have a large part of it that is deterministic, where we write down differential equations, ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations. And a lot of this is the foundation of our field. And very often when we have a new problem, we ask ourselves, can we do it like that? But the more accurate description is always the stochastic one. And uh, then once you have a stochastic description, sometimes you ask, how can I, in certain limits, recover the deterministic description? But what I focus here in my talk is actually the stochastic description, the probabilistic description to the evolutionary process. And I will have two, talk, two parts of my talk. I will first talk about constant selection, and then I will talk about non-constant selection. So constant selection is this when there's a constant fitness landscape, for example. But once we play a game, or once we have social interaction, then the selection is not constant because uh, the, the fitness or the, the reproductive value of strategies changes over time, changes depending on what the population is doing. We call this frequency-dependent selection. So first part of my talk, constant selection. Second part of my talk, frequency-dependent selection. The selection coefficients depend on the relative abundance of strategies. And um, we have one the stochastic description. So here's a very simple stochastic description that I like to use, and it has been around for a long time. The population geneticist uh, Moran, Australian population geneticist, proposed it in the 50s. And it's the so-called Moran process. We have a population of size n. And we choose an individual for reproduction. And you can say that's proportional to some value, which we like to call fitness or so, some number. And then we choose another one for death. Could be the same one. And then the first one makes an offspring that replaces the second one. And then you have made one step. So that's a simple stochastic process. It's in probability theory something like an urn. You, you have two colors in there. You could have more colors, but in the beginning we do calculations with two colors and so. You, you take a ball, you reproduce it, you remove one, the total population size is constant. And the different colors can have different values of being chosen, either for birth or for death. We can put the fittest difference into birth or death or in both. It's typical enough to put it in one of them. So we put it in birth for the, for the moment. So um, the Moran process happens to be a birth death process in the theory of stochastic processes because it has a state space. And in that state space, which here happens to be one dimensional, you can make one step forward and one step backward at most, or you stay in the same place. That's the definition of a Markov process, which is a birth death process, a specific kind of Markov process. So I can have one blue individual here. And if I do my Moran process, I could then end up with two blue individuals. Two blue can go back to one or three or forward to three, but you can only make one step. That's the definition of a birth test process. Uh, for those of you who know, for example, the Wright Fisher process where I replace the whole generation, it's another model to do that. That would not be a birth test process, but it would be a Markov process. <laughs> Here I stay with the Moran process, but often the results are similar. So without mutation, there are two absorbing states, can be either red or blue. And once I am there, nothing changes anymore without mutation. So without mutation, these states are transient. If I wait long enough, I will definitely leave them, no matter how large my population is. But um, if I were in those states, without mutation, nothing will change anymore. They are absorbing. And then a typical thing that we want to know is we introduce a new mutant. And we want to know the probability that this mutant reaches fixation. If we wait long enough, either one of two things must happen. The new mutant must either die out that's extinction, or it wins the whole world, that's fixation. And we're interested in calculating these probabilities. So this is the event of fixation of the new mutant, and that's the probability of extinction of the new mutant. And nothing else could happen if we wait long enough. Um, and if we have constant selection here, then we can say the relative fitness of that thing here is R. This can be greater than one or less than one. Uh, compared to the fitness of the red one, which is 1. So it's the reproductive value. Um, and the total population size is n. And the fixation probability can be calculated as this formula here. That depends on r, and it depends on the total population size. In the limit where r goes to 1, we have neutral evolution. And in neutral evolution, the fixation probability of a new mutant is 1 over n. 
And that's completely clear for that you don't have to do any calculation because if I ask you, what's the chance that this guy wins the world? Because it's all neutral, it must be the same chance as anybody else winning the whole world. So it must be one over n. So for neutral evolution, the fixation probability is one over the population size. But if we go away from neutral evolution, we have this formula. And now a question that I like to ask that is kind of fundamental in our field is how does population structure affect natural selection? Precisely are there suppressors and amplifiers of natural selection? <clears throat> how did I first think about that question? I made mathematical models for the, for the origin, for the evolution of cancer in somatic evolution. And I thought normally we think of evolution as something desirable. It gives rise to beautiful structures, to flowers, insects, to the brain. So we like, we like evolution. But here's an evolutionary process we don't like. The organism doesn't like the evolution that leads to cancer. How can you get rid of evolution if you don't want to have it? <clears throat> One way would be not to allow mutation. So you could say, I already have paid a huge price to make sure that our cells replicate with very low mutation rate. I might actually have reached sort of a cost basis there that I'm paying so many ATPs for every base that I cannot reduce it further. So I already have mutation as low as possible. Can I get rid of selection? If I don't want evolution of cancer, can I actually get rid of selection? Can I come up with a population structure that cancels selection? Because then the dangerous mutations toward cancer would be like neutral. <clears throat> and these, are, this, these will be the so-called suppressors of selection. But first, we just ask the question, is there something that makes selection weaker? Consequently, is there also something that makes selection stronger? Or, or is it sort of all like in a well-mixed population? And in order to do this, we formulated evolutionary graph theory. And the beginning of this was actually the PhD thesis of Eris Lieberman, who also worked here at the Broad Institute. Um, so we have the idea the individuals occupy the vertices of a graph and the edges determine where to place the offspring. So we have the same as the Moran process, but now on a general graph. So the Moran process is now a special case. The Moran process is the complete graph with identical weights and self loops. So for the Moran process, we have that fixation probability. And we want to see whether changing the population structure would change the fixation probability. Let us try some examples. You know, so a simple example instead of the complete graph, we also call this the well-mixed population. It's a, it's a strange name because well-mixed is not the same as well-stirred. There are some papers about that recently, but it's the complete graph. Um, so here's an example, the directed cycle. Let's suppose my cells reproduce such that the offspring of this would go here, the offspring of this goes here, and so on. And the fixation probability of a randomly placed mutant can be easily calculated in this example also, and we get the same formula. So here we have changed the, populations, the population structure very much, but it's the same fixation probability. So with respect to just the probability of selection, which measures somehow how selection operates, then nothing has happened here. Time could have changed. Time is sort of a more complicated time until fixation could have changed. Um, but the probability of fixation has not changed. Here's the cycle. You know, you can go backward and forward now and also very easy calculation. Again, nothing has changed. Yes? How can you have fixation if you can move back to the initial position at any time? So, in each, each, in each example. In, in any of these, well, I guess except for this one because you can fall into the red one. Or the yeah, so here I basically, if that one is chosen for reproduction, then I have two blue. And then if I choose that one, I have three blue. And in the end, if I choose that one, I have all of blue and it's over, game is over. Oh, okay. And so the same can happen here or here. So the offspring goes there, that's the description. So same fixation probability. Next, we want to find a characterization of all population structures that behave like the complete graph. And in order to do this, we define the temperature of a vertex. The temperature of a vertex is the sum of all weights leading into that vertex. So the graph itself could be weighted, and then you calculate all the weights that lead into a vertex. If the weights are just zero and one, then you would sum here over binary numbers, but the weights don't have to be, it can be anything. And then the temperature of vertex J is the sum of all the weights on the graph that lead into J. And now the theorem is the so-called isothermal theorem. 
if all vertices have the same temperature, then the fixation probability is equivalent to the Moran process. So this is a characterization that allows us to construct many population structures that have the same fixation probability as the Moran process. A consequence of this is, for example, that all symmetric graphs, like regular grids, have the same fixation probability as the Moran process. That's a consequence of this. Before our work, many papers in population genetics always observed that the fixation probability didn't change, but they all looked actually at examples that were isothermal. Yes? So the, what's changing is just the amount of time it takes. Yes, exactly right. The time is interesting to calculate and sometimes difficult to calculate. Time is a big problem. It's not related to just the eigenvalue gap versus the same as like spectral. Um, the, the time has something to do with the gap and that itself is complicated to calculate. But there's, there's lots of things that could be done there. So is the fixation probability itself then just a consequence of the stationary distribution, the random opt and of what's going on? Because all of, the, in this, all of these ones have the, the uniform distribution, the stationary distribution. Is that a way of thinking of it, or is that not really relevant? Mm, I don't know. I'll be here to think about it. Um, so then, nevertheless, uh, we find something that is not isothermal, and we should yes. Is uh, so you said um, if the um, if all the temperatures are the same, then the fixation probability is the same as the Moran process. Does it also go the other way? Not necessarily, no. There is an extension uh, proven by uh, a very good graduate student, Ben Adlam, who is at BED now, and this is, if you think of the isothermal theorem, you ask for something which is a very severe restriction, because all the temperatures have to be exactly the same. But if you think of something like an early Schrödinger graph, um, you might have that the temperatures are approximately the same, but not exactly the same. So the proof by Ben is the so-called robust isothermal theorem. If all vertices have the approximately the same temperature, then the fixation probability is close to the Moran process. So this is a robust extension of the isothermal theorem. Otherwise, the isothermal theorem would be kind of only for a non-generic case. And then for some random graph models, we can actually prove things like erdos rheny and other random graphs. We observe things numerically, and we don't know how to prove. Um, but uh, this is a theorem that is proven. Uh, but here are now suppressors of selection. Suppressors of selection are actually easy to construct. So we have this line here, or we have this burst. And if you ask for that graph, what is the fixation probability of a randomly placed mutant? A mutant can only reach fixation if it is randomly placed here. If it is placed here or here, it will definitely not reach fixation, because eventually it will be replaced. So a randomly placed mutant, independent of the relative reproductive advantage R of that mutant, it has 1 over n, because it has to be placed here. And then the fitness doesn't matter. And so the amazing thing is, this is very much the architecture of a colonic crypt where you have um, uh, a, a compartment that has like one or a few stem cells at the bottom and then there's cell division and differentiation and you move up the crypt and you die at the end of the crypt. So the colonial crypt as an epithelial tissue is kind of organized in my opinion as a suppressor of selection. And we could say why and we could say maybe because that's a protection against cancer because advantageous mutations there behave almost like neutral mutations. So human epithelial tissues and the hematopoietic system, where many, many cell divisions actually occur, are suppressors of selection, thereby reducing the onset of cancer. But yes? But in those ones, like in a crypt, the cells, once the stem cell divides, these cells up here on the villi are not divided. So probably the cell that's the blue, assuming blue mm -hmm. is bad, is actually more likely than 1 over n to be at the base of the crypt, right? Um, so the interesting thing is, here the crypt divides, it moves up. This cell divides, it moves up. So there is cell division also up here, hierarchically, also in the hematopoietic system. In the hematopoietic system, actually, most cell division, it's more tree-like, occurs at the end. Approximately 10 to the 11 cell divisions every day. But very few of those cell divisions occur in cells that are here to stay for a significant amount of time. And the stem cells in the hematopoietic system divide maybe only once a week or once a month, and there could be as few as a thousand of them. So you greatly reduce the risk of cancer-causing mutations in situations where you need many cell divisions. I think 
there's, there's a strong argument that this is like a suppressor of selection. But the next thing is we want to ask, what about amplifiers? Can we find amplifiers? And um, Erich Lieberman in his PhD thesis found the first amplifier and the amplifier is a star. And the star here has a center and that center is actually hot because many things lead into it and the periphery is cold. And if you calculate the fixation probability of a randomly placed mutant on the star, it's actually that formula here. If you look at that formula, then it's the same as the old formula, but R has been replaced by R squared. So that's precisely an amplifier because if my fitness advantage was two, now it's four. If my fitness advantage is one half, this advantage, now it's one quarter. So it augments advantageous mutants and it reduces disadvantageous mutants. So the star is an amplifier of selection. The question is, can we find something that is even better than that? So here this goes from R to R squared. <coughs> But how, how far can we get? You know, what kind of structure can we actually find? In fact, uh, Lieberman in his PhD thesis found a structure that is an arbitrarily strong amplifier of natural selection, uh, where it guarantees the fixation of any advantageous mutant, however small that advantage is. And what was that structure? And that was a superstar. And I have absolutely no clue how he came actually up with that structure. Um, but uh, it has a center, and then it has these leaves here. And it has a minimal loop. It, the minimal loop as drawn here is three. The minimal loop, in, if you look for loops, is actually three. That length of the minimal loop will turn out to be that exponent k. And then, if we want to make that loop longer, we just add more nodes in here. So we could add one more, and then it would be four. Two more, then it's five, and so on. And then we have to make more nodes also in here and more leaves. So the number of leaves is, is, uh, should be the same as the number of those nodes here and that should become very, very large. And then we can make K larger, larger, arbitrarily large and that's an arbitrarily strong amplifier. And our Nature paper uh, published in 2005, I believe, contained the amplifier, uh, the superstars and arbitrarily strong amplifier, the claim, and it had a proof and the proof was wrong. And it was actually the correct proof was only published like uh, two years, one or two years ago by computer scientists. And it's, a, it's in a paper that has 100 pages. And they give a correct proof. So the statement that the, that the superstar is a strong amplifier is correct. Uh, but they give a correct proof for that. And so the interesting thing is we had this very weird structure out there and we wanted to find others. And somehow other structures in the last 10 years uh, have remained elusive until very recently. Uh, so first, uh, my friend Krishnendra Chatterjee, a computer scientist at the Institute of Science and Technology, Austria, he actually uh, made the following observations, that amplifiers are sensitive to how the mutants arise. So if you think that the mutants, they could arise uniformly at random, so the cell gets hit by a cosmic ray and now it's a mutant, that would be uniformly at random, or the mutant arises during a reproductive event. That's more likely. So if the mutant arises during the reproductive event, then the star and the superstar, they amplify only for one, but not for two. So we only had actually amplifiers for this way of seeding mutations and not for that way of seeding mutations. The star could be rescued by making a looping star. So you make self loops in the periphery and that allows an amplifier for, for uh, mutants that are during reproductive events, or any linear combination of that. But what about arbitrarily strong amplifiers for this kind of seating? And only recently we actually made the very surprising finding that almost any topology can be turned into an arbitrarily strong amplifier by adding weights and self-loops. So we can start with almost any topology of the population and then tune the magnitude of those links and thereby get a structure that guarantees the fixation of advantageous mutants. And the idea is somehow that you generate these links such that you have a mainland and a bunch of islands. And the mutants arise on the islands and they drift towards the mainland and then they take over the mainland and from the mainland they spread back to the islands. And if you do the weights properly, you can really prove that these are arbitrarily strong amplifiers of natural selection. 
So uh, I hope to think, you know, that this could be useful structures for a laboratory experiment where you definitely want to hold on to advantageous mutants. You could, instead of a well-mixed population, you could use something like this and therefore very much increase the chances that advantageous mutants will reach fixation or almost get certainty. The drawback is the time. So, so far, all the structures, the better they are in guaranteeing selection, the worse they are in the time that it takes for selection. And so right now we are running computer simulations where we are looking for structures that are sort of good in a time fixation trade-off. They need not be arbitrarily strong amplifier, but they should also have a time that shouldn't sort of be too large. But the idea is that you could actually make population structures that increase the probabilities that advantageous mutations take over. And uh, that could be useful, hopefully. So now I go to the second part of my talk, and this is non-constant selection, frequency-dependent selection. That's games. We play games. The field is called evolutionary game theory. And mathematically, similar structures can be found in ecology, also in infection dynamics. Here, the success of something depends on what others are doing. So we play, typically we play a game. So if we have just two strategies, then a game is given by a payoff matrix. And this is strategy A. It gets a payoff of little a when meeting another A player and little b when meeting another B player. And this is the payoff for a B player interacting with an A player and a B player. I, I start with something like a Moran process. I have I many A players, N minus I many B players. Then the payoff for A is I have I get payoff little a when I meet another A player. There are I minus one other A players because I'm also an A player. And there are N minus one other players, so I divide by N minus one plus B times N minus I is the number of B players. So the idea is that my fitness arises from these pairwise interactions with all others in the population. Well, fitness is a linear function of the relative abundance of the strategies in the population. So this could be now sales, or it could be people in an experiment. This is what we are doing in evolutionary game theory. <clears throat> now, I translate the payoff that I have in the game into something like the reproductive value. And I do this with a function where I say that the reproductive value is 1 plus W. W is a parameter, and that's the intensity of selection times the payoff. And this parameter w here, I don't have to use a linear function. I can also use exponential function or many other functions, but this linear function sort of works, and we use it often, not always. But the interesting observation is here that this parameter w <laughs> scales the intensity of selection. In the traditional approach of deterministic evolutionary dynamics to games, that parameter was not observed because it cancels out. If you actually write down the so-called replicator equation of evolutionary game theory and you introduce something like this parameter, it cancels out immediately. It only changes the speed of the differential equation, but not the outcome. So the intensity of selection didn't matter in the classical approach to games, but here it actually plays an important role. And especially this limit of weak selection will be one where many calculations are possible that are not possible otherwise. So weak selection means that our reproductive values are all approximately the same, the game that we are playing right now only makes a small contribution. You can also think of it in that way. We are playing many games. That game is only one of many games. You can also think of it, um, I'm very confused about payoffs. I more or less pick people from whom I learn randomly. That's another way to get weak selection. Um, so again, we want to calculate the fixation probability of a uh, a, a new mutant, so we have strategy A is now being generated by mutation. We want to know whether strategy A is taking over uh, or whether it becomes extinct. And this is a formula that can be written down from the birth death process. And we ask if the fixation probability is greater than 1 over n, then selection <laughs> favors the strategy A replacing B. Because fixation probability equal to 1 over n is neutral drift. So if the fixation probability is greater than neutral drift, apparently selection favors that process. The process that is being favored is the fixation of the newly introduced strategy. So we want to know this here greater than one. We have defined those g i values and f i values. They're just here. So in principle, we can write down this sum, and we can ask when is it greater than one. And we don't really get a nice condition unless we are um, in the limit of weak selection. 
In the limit of weak selection at any n, we can actually write something down, but in the limit of weak selection at large n, the condition becomes very interesting because it is a plus 2b greater than c plus 2d. These were the elements of the payoff matrix. And if this holds, then selection favors a replacing b. And what is the interpretation of this condition? It's the so-called one-third rule. And this is selection favors A replacing B if the fitness of A is greater than the fitness of B at frequency one-third. There's something very interesting. The fitness is a linear function of A. The fitness is a linear function of B. You look at the frequency of A between 0 and 1. You take the point where the frequency is one-third. At that point, you ask which one has higher fitness. And if A has higher fitness at that point, then the overall fixation probability is actually favored. And that was very surprising to us uh, and also to other people. And other people proved this one third rule holds almost for any process you can imagine, not just the Moran process. It's very hard to construct an evolutionary process where it doesn't hold for weak selection. And intuitively, we found a reason also what is happening here. And this is, I average over stochastic trajectories that all start here. So my stochastic trajectory start with the invasion of A. These stochastic trajectories, they go up there, they could go back, they could either hit here or there. Averaging over those stochastic trajectories, I can ask the question, how often is my opponent A and how often is my opponent B? And the answer is one third of the time my opponent is A and two thirds of the time my opponent is B. And that's exactly the, if I'm an A individual, then that's my fitness. If I meet others one third and two thirds, and if I'm B individual, then that's my fitness if I meet others one third and two thirds. And that's the intuition behind the one third rule. So that's not the only question we ask. We would want to ask not only when fixation is favored compared to neutral, we could ask in a mutation selection equilibrium, which strategy is favored? Does strategy A or strategy B win in a mutation selection equilibrium? Uh, and the statement is that A is more abundant than B if that condition here holds that this was proven by Tibor Antal, who is now a professor in Edinburgh. And this statement is, here the simple coefficient that's just the population size. If the population size is large, that's just one. If that is one, that is A plus B is greater than C plus D. That's a famous statement in game theory that's called risk dominance. If we play a coordination game where the diagonal values are greater than the off diagonal values, then it's the basin of attraction of the A solution greater than the other one. Or in other words, if we play a game, a coordination game, I minimize, I, I maximize my uh, expectation if I play strategy A, if I assume that you play half-half. Um, and so this is how it scales with population size. And the amazing thing is that result holds for any mutation rate in a mutation selection equilibrium, any intensity of selection, and for many processes. That's actually a result where we don't need weak selection. For many processes, but not for all processes, this is where the difficulty in that result lies. For which processes, and for which process it doesn't hold. But if you don't need a low mutation and you don't need weak selection. That's a very general result. And then we wanted to know how can we generalize this result from two strategies to any number of strategies. So we play games with more than two strategies. There can be different cell types. They all embody a different strategy or something like the rock, paper, scissors game. Or we can, in general, we have n strategies. And for n strategies, uh, we can derive again a method, and the, the result is sort of surprisingly simple, but we do need weak selection. For n strategies, we need weak selection, and the, the result becomes very nice if we also have a large population size. And then the statement is, for low mutation, strategy k is more abundant than average if this here holds. So these are the elements of my payoff matrix. The payoff matrix is now an n by n matrix. And these are precisely the pairwise risk dominance evaluations that we also had before. So before A plus B minus C minus D. Now I do this pairwise for strategy K with every other strategy I. And I average over those pairwise comparisons. And if on average I'm risk dominant, I'm favored by selection. It is intuitively clear why this is the result because we have low mutation. So if we have n strategies, we are on the simplex Sn. The, the, the sum over all the frequencies of every strategy, Xi is always one. So we are in the simplex Sn. But if mutation is low, at any one time, I have at most two strategies present. And therefore, I only calculate competition pairwise between all possible pairs. 
and therefore by summarizing, sum, summing over those pairwise competitions, because I'm in low mutation, I get the answer. But it is amazing that the answer can be read off directly from the payoff matrix. So you give me the payoff matrix, and we can immediately say which strategies are favored by selection and which are not favored by selection. Low mutation. What about high mutation? High mutation should be easy. So high mutation, this is the answer. What's happening at high mutation? Mutation is so high that all strategies are present at the same time. And moreover, all strategies are present in this middle point of the simplex at equal abundance. Because otherwise, mutation is not high enough. Uh, and so if I'm there, I can just ask, what is my payoff there? This is just I'm averaging over all my interactions with all the strategies. And I compare this to the average payoff of all the strategies. So this is my payoff against all other strategies. And they are equally abundant minus the average pair of all strategies against each other. And that's the high mutation condition. And now the amazing thing of that result, which was also found by Deepo Antal, is actually for any mutation, it's a linear combination of the two. And that is really beautiful because the mutation rate here comes as population size times mutation rate as this factor here. Um, and we don't intuitively understand why it is linear. There's no reason a priori why it should be linear. So this is an open question in that field to actually understand the reason for the linearity in the mutation rate. We understand for weak selection the linearity of the payoff values, but the linearity of the mutation rate is surprising. This is proven, um, and the intuition is still kind of interesting. So again, we just can read off from the payoff matrix for any mutation rate whether strategy is favored or not. But now we want to do the same thing as we did before. We want to ask, how does population structure affect games? Before we asked, how does population structure affect constant selection? Now population structure at frequency-dependent selection at games. Games is a shorthand for frequency-dependent selection where the fitness functions are linear. So if I want to have more than that, nonlinear fitness functions, there would be many, many unanswered questions. But that's what games are typically doing in biology. So the idea is we are, again, we are on a graph, and we play the game with neighbors, and we have a payoff matrix here. And then we have an update rule. And the update rule that I want to discuss in the remainder of the talk is so-called death birth updating. There would be others, and the outcome depends on the update rule. But here I focus on this one. So a random individual is chosen. It will update its strategy by looking at the neighbors. And the neighbors win that point proportional to success, proportional to payoff. So it could be a social setting where I say, I want to rethink what I'm doing. I'm looking at my friends, and I pick something from a friend who is doing well. And the game that we are playing, let's play a particular game at first. You know, it's the so-called donation game. This is a special prisoner's dilemma. There are two strategies, cooperators and defectors. And if two cooperators meet, the payoff is B minus C. Um, because I'm paying a cost and you have a benefit. You paying a cost and I have a benefit. So my payoff is B minus C. If I'm a cooperator and you are a defector, I'm just paying a cost and I have no benefit. If you are a cooperator and I'm a defector, I only get the benefit, I have no cost. And two defectors, you have zero. So that's a game which is called prisoner's dilemma. It's a special prisoner's dilemma. It's a so-called donation game. Um, the prisoner's dilemma can be also defined more generally. But we will also derive results that really hold for any game anyway. But evolution of cooperation is always an interesting game. It's very interesting to study that game because in a well-mixed population, defectors would always win. So by finding population structures where cooperators actually win, I have discovered a mechanism for evolution of cooperation. And that mechanism is population structure can favor cooperation. So you could have cells that pay a cost in order to help other cells. And if these cells live in certain structures, that could actually be favored by natural selection. And at first, we did computer simulations of this uh, setup. And we did it like on the cycle, on the lattice, random regular graphs, random graphs, and scale-free networks. And we found sort of that the fixation probability as a function of the benefit to cost ratio sort of always increasing, and there's a point where it crosses one over the population size. And that's the point that we wanted to calculate. That's kind of the critical benefit to cost ratio needed for selection to favor cooperation. And um, a postdoc of mine, Hisashi Otsuki, really was able to prove a very beautiful formula. 
And this is a regular graph of degree k, cooperators win over defectors if the simplest possible thing holds that you could imagine. Benefit over cost is greater than k, and that also holds for weak selection. At that time, we have actually explored spatial games for more than 20 years. There was no analytical result in that area. There were observations. That was the first analytical result. The first analytical result is the simplest you could possibly imagine. And uh, it's, it's not easy to prove, but also the reason why it holds is this weak selection here. So if we hadn't had weak selection, we wouldn't have actually observed that result. And this idea of weak selection became powerful sort of in 2004 and later. So on a regular graph of degree k, that means every individual has the same number of friends, k friends. If the benefit to cost ratio in my game is greater than k, natural selection overall favors cooperation. This is interesting because in a well-mixed population, natural selection always opposes cooperation. Unconditional cooperators don't win. But unconditional cooperators here win in the spatial setting. Um, so weak selection. Many people ask us the question, uh, can we prove something without assuming weak selection? So we want to study games and graphs, but let's not do weak selection. And this is actually a question that is in the territory of computer scientists. Uh, because, uh, and that's also work with Krishnetto Chatterjee, uh, the question is, I give you any graph and any game on it, and your task is to write an algorithm that, for example, tells me if the strategy has a positive fixation probability or gives me the fixation probability. So we call this the qualitative question. So I give you a graph, I give you a game, and I ask, what is the complexity of an algorithm that tells me whether the fixation probability is greater than zero? Or I ask, what's the complexity of an algorithm that approximates the fixation probability within a certain bound? And that, as you know, is sort of the universe of computer science. This is sort of the class of problems sort of categorized in computer science. And this would be problems that can be solved in polynomial time. And then we have non-deterministic polynomial time. And then we have sharp P complete. This would be kind of problems that can enumerate solutions in polynomial time. And then these are P space complete. These are problems that can be solved in polynomial space. And the fundamental question of computer science and one of the biggest problems in mathematics is precisely the question whether the class P is the same as the class NB. And as you know, in other words, this would be for all, for all problems where an algorithm can actually verify a solution in polynomial time, is there also an algorithm that can generate a solution in polynomial time? That's the question. And if B is equal to NB, then the question would be answered in the, in the affirmative, uh, but this is not expected. The, the expectation is that B is not equal to NB. And therefore, many proofs in computer science are like this. They don't say something is impossible. They just say, if you have an algorithm for this problem, then actually you would have answered, if you have a polynomial time algorithm for this problem, you would have answered B is equal to NB, which is not expected. So many papers in computer science are of that kind. You know, it's not, the statement is not, you can't do that. But if you were to do this in polynomial time, then that would imply B equal, is equal to NP. We don't expect that. So for simple uh, games on graphs, if we really have not the limit of weak selection, you are very quickly in a complexity class that would be like B space complete. So you do not expect simple <coughs> mathematical formulas for those things. You don't expect formulas that can be evaluated in, poly in polynomial time. Um, but there's a question there, and this is the computational complexity of the weak selection case. So the computer scientists also ask themselves, of course, the question, what if I give you any graph, but I'm still in weak selection? What's the computational complexity of that? And they couldn't make progress on this one way or the other. So they could not prove that's easy, and they could not prove that's hard. And at the same time, uh, some postdocs of mine worked with postdocs of uh, Xing Tung Yao and also Xing Tung Yao himself. And over two years, they actually had meetings there. And they came up with a method to calculate for any graph for weak selection in polynomial time. So they actually proved by construction. So weak selection, any graph. And this was this paper that was published last year in Nature. And uh, S.T. Yao is a very eminent mathematician. And um, the this is, the, this is how the algorithm works, approximately. You introduce a single mutant in a random place. You have no mutation. You introduce a single mutant in a random place on a graph, and then you have the time until 
the, pro the situation resolves in either fixation or extinction. So you have the expected time until starting from a single mutant, everything goes back to original wild type or the mutant takes over. And that's ca time capital T. And interestingly, that's not a time we can actually calculate. We don't know how to calculate this. But luckily, it cancels out in the formula that we need in the end. But we have to at least formulate the concept. And next, we have the time tau ij, which is the coalescence time. This is the meeting time of random walks starting in i and j on the graph. So you start in two positions i and j, and you perform random walks on the graph with the weights, whatever weights the graph has, and you ask how long until these random walks meet. And that is also called the coalescence time. And why, intuitively, why would we need this in biology? Because that is a measure for how likely it is that those two individuals have the same strategy. Because they kind of, you go back in time and you ask, and how long until they derive from the same common ancestor? Therefore, capital T minus tau ij is now the expected time during which i and j have the same strategy in that process. So we have this quantity and we have those quantities and those quantities are related to those. That's the meeting time of two random walks that start k steps away from each other. So we average over all those ij pairs in such a way that we take exactly those that are k steps away from each other. And all of those meeting times of random walks on graphs can be calculated by solving a linear system of equations. So that is polynomial time. Uh, intuitively, the condition then is the following. We have an individual that updates its strategy, and we want to know the chances that a cooperator here wins against an opponent who is also bidding for that individual. What is the payoff of that cooperator? The payoff of that cooperator is minus C. Uh, it pays that price whenever it is a cooperator. It is a cooperator for the duration of the process minus the time that an individual is not the same strategy as itself. You know, that is zero. So it pays, if it's a cooperator, it pays the whole duration of the process. And then we have to ask, and what is its benefit? So the benefit arises from all the one-step neighbors also being cooperators. So that's the expected time during which one-step neighbors of a cooperator are cooperators. And then that's the payoff of that cooperator here. And in order to win that side, it has to outcompete something that is also bidding for that side. So what's the payoff of that side? It is a cooperator, in which case it would pay a cost C for the duration T minus T2, and T2 is the time at which a two-step neighbor of a cooperator is a cooperator. And it has a benefit from the three-step, so its one-step neighbors are the three-step neighbors of that guy, and they give it a benefit, and that's the probability that they are cooperators. So you have that formula here, and if you look at that formula, capital T cancels out, and you get that simple condition. So the benefit to cost ratio is really given by the meeting times of random walks that start two, three, one, two, three steps away from each other. And you can now use this to calculate many uh, examples of games on graphs that we couldn't calculate before. So, and interesting things can be observed. So here's a star, and a star does not support evolution of cooperation. A star has a benefit to cost ratio that is infinite. But you link two stars via their hub and you get the benefit to cost ratio that is five over two. All of this is for large population size. You link them via leaves and you get a benefit to cost ratio of three. So by introducing very sim sim simple bridges, you can actually make very cooperative societies. Uh, ben Allen, who is the lead author here, he was very proud to be able to calculate this, the, the ceiling fan that has a benefit to cost ratio of eight. And he was also calculating the wheel of Dharma that has a benefit to cost ratio of, of quadratic equation and then we had already started like millions of graphs and we have never found a graph where the critical benefit to cost ratio was less than the average degree so that was a conjecture the critical benefit to cost ratio always is greater than the average degree but after checking a million or several million graphs we found that actually and that is a counter example so the critical benefit to cost ratio is 3 um, over 2 1.5 but the average degree is 2 um, then we asked ourselves, 
because we want to be good citizens. So we ask ourselves, well, what's the best society that we can build? Now that we know how the structure of society can promote cooperation, what's the ideal society? What's the society that maximally boosts cooperation in this game? And actually, it's a society that is based on strong pairwise relationships. So you start with any graph, you make very strong pairwise partnerships, and that boosts cooperation arbitrarily strong. Uh, so we calculate other things. Um, then we calculate many, many uh, families of random graph uh, models and so on. And, and then Babak, a postdoc of mine and Nachme, they, they have some artistic uh, side to them also. They wanted to do all graphs of a small size. So they make this painting for all graphs of size four. Um, and this uh, is the line here. And this has a critical benefit to cost ratio of four. This is sort of achievable. Then this has a critical benefit to cost ratio that is infinite. So you never favor cooperation on those structures. And down here, it's even worse than that. Not only do you not favor cooperation, but you favor spite. So here, natural selection would actually favor a behavior where you pay a cost to harm somebody else. So this is kind of a hell situation here. <laughs> so this favors spite, and this is a promoter of cooperation. So these are all graphs of size four. What about all graphs of size five? Down here, you have the hell of spite. And then here you have this array where you, according to the critical benefit to cost ratio, this is like the best, this is the line, then this branched graph, then the cycle of length six and so on, until the critical benefit to cost ratio becomes pretty large, until it becomes infinite. Um, now uh, all graphs of size six, and then he ran out of patience, um, but all graphs of size six, the best is the line here again, and then other structures. But one thing that we already explored, um, the line is the best for all graphs up to size 26, but then it actually is no longer the best. Then it starts to branch what is the best structure. So there are amusing things uh, that can be done here. Um, but of course, we not only solve evolution of cooperation, we solve any game. Once you have evolution of cooperation, you have solved any game. Um, I will show that in a moment. But for any two by two game, the payoff matrix is like this. And the relevant condition can be written like this here. And if you look at those coefficients here, the whole thing, it must make sense that strategy A, for example, is favored by making little a bigger. So based on the understanding of the game, it must be that this is positive. And it must be that that is positive. But to prove that actually on a graph, there was quite some work. So that is now also proven that these structures are really positive. But based on the intuition of the game, it had to be like that. And um, you can divide then also by this quantity here. You have a factor here, which we call the sigma factor. And this relates to a theorem, because for two strategies and any population structure, A is more abundant than B for weak selection and any mutation rate. It can always be written in that way, where sigma is a number that needs to be calculated. And that's a theorem that is based on the symmetry of the problem. It always has to be, the, the answer has to have that shape. Um, a spatial process somehow in weak selection does the following thing. It augments the entries, the importance of the diagonal values here. It is more important how you play against yourself than you play against the other type of strategy. And how much more important that is, the stronger you promote cooperation. So the whole problem in solving a spatial problem is calculating sigma. But we always know that there's a sigma. And critical PC ratio can immediately be rewritten in terms of a sigma. There's always there's a relationship there. And that holds for two strategies, any population structure, any mutation rate, weak selection. And then a student in my class asked the question about uh, n strategies, any population structure. And that's also a paper with Karina Danica. And here, the surprising answer is, if you go to n strategies, there are still there are only two sigma values. So for any number of strategies, for two strategies, you have one sigma value. And for n strategies, you have two sigma values, but not more than that. And that here is also totally related to what I showed you in my talk for deepest result for uh, well-mixed population, n strategies, any mutation rate. In some sense, in that scenario, this is like the low mutation term, and that's the high mutation term. But now it holds in a structured population. And here, the really cool thing is that we know that this is the answer, but there are very few examples where we can even calculate those sigma values. And um, I had the, the privilege to work with many brilliant people over the years. Um, thank you very much.